I want to start off with a question. How many people in this room are left-handed? A. <laughs> so I see three people. We're going to do a little bit of a thought experiment for you three. And we're going to go back to the Middle Ages. And I have bad news for you guys. As you would expect, you guys are all possessed by the devil. <laughs> and that's what they thought back in the Middle Ages. They thought that uh, being left-handed was a sign of possession by the devil. The right hand was the hand of God, and the left hand was demonic. And so people who were left-handed in nature um, would be subject to brutal punishment. And in some cases, they would actually cut off someone's left hand. And this has a lot of uh, roots in language, too. The Latin word for left is sinister. And this makes sense, right? Like, we know that when I, when I say something is correct, it's right. It's righteous. Human rights. Everything is right. Which is interesting. And this sort of mentality continued to the 20th century, where we have phrases like two left feet, which is when someone is a really bad dancer. They have two left feet. I would have two left feet. <laughs> and in a lot of cultures, you say two left hands, when someone is uh, really clumsy. Two left hands. Like I said, it continued to the 20th century where in a lot of classrooms, left-handedness was taught to be a syndrome. It was something that was abnormal and had to be corrected in students. This is a book, The Prevention and Correction of Left-Handedness in Children. And back then, it would be normal for a teacher to slap someone on the wrist with a yardstick if they were using their left hand to write, because the right hand was the correct way. But good news! For all you left-handed people, it's 2015. 10% of Americans are left-handed, and they don't face any discrimination in America. It's a good time for everyone. Sorry, I spoke too soon. Uh, <coughs> cameras. If anyone has held a camera, a lot of people hold their cameras right now, every button on a camera is on the right side. So left-handed people have a hard time using cameras. And of course, you can buy left-handed cameras. But they're going to cost more, and you have to get them from specialty dealers. But, other than cameras, we're good. Oh, uh, sorry, mouses as well. Mouses are also inherently right-handed. If you buy a desktop computer, it's going to come with a left-handed mouse. Sorry, a right-handed mouse, and you have to buy a specialty left-handed mouse. And the same thing applies to golf clubs, and musical instruments, and lecture halls. Any left-handed person who has been in a lecture hall knows that most lecture halls are built with the desks on the right side. And when I take tests in a classroom, a lot of times they'll have a big desk at the front, and they'll say, all the left-handed people take a test at this desk, because it's hard for them to take a test on the right. And we all, we all know shaking hands is done with your right hand. What happens if you shake someone's hand with your left hand? It's seen as disrespectful. It's seen as you don't understand society. And every left-handed person knows this. <laughs> <laughs> this is something affectionately called Silver Surfer Syndrome. <laughs> and, um, it's not a disease, it is uh, <laughs> The English language is written from left to right, and unfortunately for left-handed people, anytime they write, they smudge over everything they wrote, and this happens, and all their text gets all blurry. Um, so you get my point. My point is that left-handed people have been sidelined throughout history for something that's not really in their control. So my question is, why? Why is this? And you know what? It's pretty simple. Here it is. We're really good at being intolerant of people who are different from the norm. And the norm is this idea that we have collectively constructed that defines what is appropriate behavior and appropriate ways to be in this weird. And things <coughs> outside of the norm make us uncomfortable and sometimes scared. And after all, comes down to the human emotion. We fear the unknown. Things that are different from us make us uncomfortable. Whether someone acts differently from you, holds a different opinion, or just looks different. So out of this fear of the unknown comes a disregard for those who are different. And there's a derogatory word we use to describe those who are different and ideas that are different. That word is weird. And we say this when we dislike something or someone when we don't understand it and when it doesn't correspond to our world view. And some of you might be seeing this and thinking, oh, that sucks. 
I would never use that. I would never say weird if, if, I, if I had that knowledge. But it's inherent in all of us because of evolution. Our early cave dweller ancestors had to be cautious of things that were different from them. We were instinctually evolved to look at something that was maybe something that was making us uncomfortable or something that was out of the ordinary and we didn't quite understand. And we would look at it and be fearful of it. And that fear was beneficial to our survival. And so those cautious genetics were inherited by us all. But I'm here to tell you those instincts are no longer necessary. I think that the world should be encouraging of people who have different ideas. Because the minds that shape the future are those that think and act creatively. We live in a world where thinking differently is the new normal. And I use the example of left-handed because not long ago, those who were left-handed, those people in this room, were considered weird and were ostracized by humanity. But I think everyone in this room will agree that being left-handed is not grounds to ostracize someone anymore. So this is proof that what's normal changes. And we can all agree on that. So that brings me again to the word weird. When we use the word weird in a negative context, what we're really doing is we're perpetuating the notion that we should dislike things if they don't correspond to our world view. I think this is a really crummy way to live, to be honest. And um, when you think about it, this is central to every conflict in the world. Two sides hold different norms, and when those norms conflict, a bigger conflict arises. So I think a better way to be is that we should try to understand things first and then decide if we like them or not. And it's true. It's normal to dislike things. We can dislike people and ideas, but I think it's so much more constructive if you dislike something after you've understood it. And you know, after you've taken the time to understand something, maybe you'll end up liking it even though you didn't think you would just because you educated yourself. And I have a secret. This took me a really long time to realize. So let me tell you a bit about myself. So when I was growing up, I had always been, in my mind, and in my interpretation of who I was, I was a judgmental person. I was sort of closed off to new ideas, and I didn't like things that I didn't understand. <coughs> and so therefore, I didn't like trying new things because I was afraid of, of the unknown. One thing I did understand growing up was how to operate a camera. And a few of you know this about me, but I started my own business when I was 16, and for the last three years, I've been making videos about everything. And I really, really enjoy looking at the world through the lens of my camera and editing it to be a better place than it is. And one of my first assignments was a video called Create. And this was, like I said, it was assigned to me. And basically, my uh, high school district came to me and said, we want a video about creative students, students who do things differently, who think differently and act differently. And I was not immediately inclined to make this video. But I did. And while making this video, I met someone named Lauren. And Lauren likes to cosplay. Cosplay is when you dress up like characters from movies and TV shows and video games and you go to conventions and you meet people who are into the same thing. And I'll be honest, before I spoke with Lauren, I was kind of on the fence. I thought cosplay was weird. And this was because I didn't know anything about it. I didn't have that interpretation at the time, but in retrospect, I didn't know anything about it and so I passed it off as weird. That is, until I interviewed Lauren. And this is Lauren in a costume of a character that she made herself, in a costume she made herself. And what she told me was, cosplay was a way for her to express her interests and express herself in the same way that filmmaking was my way of expressing myself. And this became a common pattern to a lot of videos that I would end up making. I would have a preconceived idea of who, of who someone was, 
and I had this preconceived idea that they were so different from me and so weird, only to realize they were so similar. <coughs> I met all kinds of people while filmmaking for the, la for the last three years. I met musicians and poets and dancers and orthodontists and other filmmakers like myself. And what I learned was <coughs> there's something incredibly personal about the interview process. And there's something really, really powerful about that one-on-one -on -one experience of talking to someone and interviewing them and having that on video and looking through that video and analyzing the way you talk to someone and hearing it over and over. My career has forced me to sit down and talk to people who I would never have the motivation to talk to otherwise. People with amazing stories and brilliant ideas, people who wrote with their left hands and their right hands, and the abundance of their inquisitive minds. Last summer I did a series with the University of Iowa where I was the lead filmmaker and we traveled around the Midwest and we filmed young entrepreneurs, students who were doing amazingly creative things out of their garages. And I got to sit down with each and every one of them and talk to them about what it means to think differently, to act differently, despite adversity. Also last year, I did a film called Canvas, where I sat and I documented, for two months, I documented six canvas painters. And if you have any painters in here, you can attest to the fact that a canvas takes a very long time to make and to paint. And so I sat there, I sat there with them for hours on end, selectively <clears throat> choosing what to film and what not to film, but I had to fill up the rest of the time. And so I filled that time up with conversation and I learned about them. And I learned about what kind of passion goes into painting. And it was one of the most enlightening experiences of my life. So the point is, I've performed hundreds of interviews. And I've had that good fortune in my life, in my short life, to have been conversationally exposed to just about every type of person there is. And after all of this, I realized that things I thought of as weird were only misunderstood. And the world was so much bigger than I saw it. And I'm not a perfect person. But the exposure to life I've had at such a young age has given me an interesting perspective on life. That brings us back to the word weird. We all say it, whether consciously or not. It creeps into our language. And we use it to describe people, ideas, movies, music. Once I started filming so many people who had starkly different ideas about the world than I did, my outlook gradually changed. And I'll be honest, I don't like telling people not to use a word. I hate when people do that to me. <coughs> but the word weird, as a derogatory term, is representative of a bigger idea. And that idea is that we should fear things just because we don't understand them. And if you take a step back from that, that's where all conflict in the world is derived. Different sides hold different norms. When those norms don't meet, conflict happens. And polarization occurs. And the lefties separate from the righties, as I said in my example. So I'm not an expert, but I will tell you what I've learned and how to change your outlook if you're willing to do so. Number one, wiggle. <laughs> um, give your mind some wiggle room. The person you are today is nothing like the person you were five years ago. The person you are today is likely to be nothing like the person you are going to be five years from now. <coughs> so I guess have the idea that your opinions are always changing, the world is always changing, and you're always growing. Number two, talk to people. And it's easier when you have a camera in your hand, but you don't have to have a camera to have an excuse to talk to someone new. And if you don't like someone because you think they're weird, ask yourself this question. Is it because I don't understand their way of thinking? And, you should <coughs> and lastly, be yourself. And I know that is so cliche. And it's so much easier said than done 
because the world is such a harsh place. But imagine a world where everyone understood everyone else. We wouldn't agree on everything, but we would at least be able to respect the opinions of others because we understood where they came from and we understood what kind of experiences influenced those opinions. And when it comes down to it, we're all human. We're all a little weird. But it's the good kind of weird. The kind of weird that thinks creatively, that acts differently, that redefines what it means to be human, that dances with two left feet. Thank you.